All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to, to give a talk here with such a large audience. Uh, and I should say right from the start that this is joint work with Gerson Caro. He's a PhD student of mine. Uh, so this project started as a request. So Gerson wanted to learn a bit about uh, abelian varieties and rational points during his first year as a PhD student. That was last year and uh, we started to meet weekly and the project somehow took a different shape and uh, this is what I want to present today. Okay, all right. Good, so the, um, the first thing is, uh, what is this uh, Chabotie-Coleman bound? So first we need to discuss Chabotie's theorem and let me start by saying that C is a smooth projected curve for simplicity, I'm going to discuss things over Q today, over the rational numbers. But uh, you can imagine things go through over, over number fields. And when that's important, I'm going to mention it, OK? So you start with this smooth projected curve over Q. And the genus is going to be at least 2. And J is going to be the Jacobian of the curve. And uh, Morder's conjecture from uh, 1922 says that uh, CQ is finite, meaning the rational points of the curve is a finite set. And uh, Chaboti made a breakthrough on this problem in 41. Uh, he proved that if uh, the rank of the Jacobian is less than the genus of the curve, and of course the genus of the curve is the dimension of the Jacobian, well, under this condition, uh, then Morder's conjecture is correct. Uh, you get finiteness of the set of rational points. And Faltings proved the full conjecture in 83, uh, along with many other wonderful theorems in the same paper. All right, but nevertheless, you, you have this more general theorem of Faltings, but we still pay attention to Chabotis technique. And the reason is that, well, uh, first, uh, this rank condition holds quite often. Okay. Okay. Holds quite often. And, uh, and the other thing is that uh, the proof is way simpler, and you can make it uh, explicit in many cases. I, I don't want to say effective, because effective usually is understood as a bound for the height that allows you to search for rational points in a variety. In this case, uh, you get an explicit bound for the number of points, okay? That, which is a slightly different thing, but uh, all right. So uh, here's a sketch of the proof. Uh, I'm skipping many details, but just to give the idea of the proof, uh, you take a rational point to start with, if you have any, because if you don't have rational points, you don't need to worry about this, right? So you use this rational point to embed the curve in the Jacobian in the usual way, uh, the Abel Jacobi map, uh, which has this uh, divisorial presentation. And uh, R, little r, is going to be the rank of the Jacobian. Now, the, the, when you look at the closure, the piadic closure of the rational points of the Jacobian, uh, that's going to be a piadic Lie group. And the piadic Lie groups probably are not uh, in the standard uh, curriculum in undergrad in mathematics, but nevertheless, this is a very classical theory. You can find this in Bourbaki, for instance, okay? And um, well, this piadic Lie group, you can bound the, the dimension using the theory of the logarithm and the exponential map for piadic Lie groups. And knowing that this is the closure of an abelian group of rank R, you get the bound that the dimension of this piadic abelian Lie group is uh, at most R. Okay, and therefore the dimension of this uh, subgroup, uh, Lie subgroup, the dimension is strictly less than the dimension of the ambient Lie group, which is uh, the Jacobian. All right, but then you look at the curve again, and the curve is sitting inside the Jacobian in some way. You look at the piadic points of this curve, and well, can it be contained completely in gamma, uh, in this piadic Lie group? Well, no, and the reason is that uh, C generates the Jacobian, okay? This is a standard fact about the Jacobian of the curve. The curve generates the Jacobian as, an, as a group, okay, with differences. And therefore, it cannot be contained in a proper subgroup. In particular, it cannot be contained in gamma, even if the subgroup is, is, is analytic rather than algebraic. And therefore, you have proper intersections, and there is some compactness argument to conclude that you have finiteness. For the piadic points of the curve intersected with this closure of the rational points. But then, of course, the rational points of the curve are exactly the same as the piadic points of the curve that happen to be rational, OK? And that's included in the intersection that we just argued that it's finite, OK? So here's a picture of what's going on. Uh, this big ambient here is uh, the Jacobian, the piadic points of the Jacobian. This plane uh, is supposed to be the 
proper Lie group that you obtain as the closure of the rational points. The dimension is strictly less than G, so it's actually a proper Lie subgroup. And then this funny curve that's kind of twisted around, that's, that's the chiatic points of your, of your curve that's not contained in any proper subgroup. Okay, that's more or less what's going on in the picture. All right, now Coleman, uh, look at this again a couple of years later, and uh, well, many years later, and uh, he realized that you can interpret this intersection of the Piadic Lie group obtained as the closure of the points. You can intersect this with the, with the Piadic points of the curve and reinterpret this as zeros of some analytic functions on the curve. And these analytic functions are obtained by means of Piadic integration, Coleman's uh, theory of Piadic integration. All right, and without going into details of the proof, uh, let me just say what the theorem says. You take a smooth projective curve over Q, you can do this over number fields, okay, no, no problem at all, uh, over Q of genus G, and the Jacobian is uh, J, and now let P be a prime number, and let us assume a couple of things. I'm going to write this in a long way rather than the short usual version, and the long way is, uh, is just to to make clear what the hypothesis mean. Okay. So what is the meaning of this condition? So first, we're going to require that the genus of the curve is at least two. And I want to call this hypothesis as hyperbolicity. And I'm gonna explain in a moment what this means, okay? But the genus is at least two. Of course, for genus one, you cannot have finiteness ensured because you, you do have elliptic curves of rank uh, bigger than zero, okay? Now, uh, P good, what is that thing? Uh, well, the curve has to have good reduction at P. And then automatically the Jacobian will also have good reduction at P. And P is not too small. And uh, you want P to be larger than two times the genus. And all of these conditions, you can somehow twist them a little bit and improve here and there under some other hypothesis. But the, 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 the theorem of Coleman uh, had, had these conditions. Okay, you can uh, somehow improve this on P, but uh, you still need to ask for something else, okay? And uh, there is this rank condition, the Chabotir rank condition, which as we discussed before, is related to the fact that you want to take the closure of the rational points and end up with a properly contained Piadic Lie group, okay? So you have these four conditions, hypervolicity, the prime is a prime of good reduction, the prime is not too small, and then you have the rank condition under this, hypothesis, uh, then the number of rational points on your curve is at most the number of FP points of your curve, which makes sense because you have good reduction and you can uh, just take that model of the curve and look at the P point, the, the mod P points. And then you add this uh, number to G minus two. And this number, well, it involves the genus. So it's a geometric uh, invariant attached to the curve. It's not really an arithmetic thing. It's not related to heights or anything like that. Okay. And the remark here is that this 2g minus 2 is not just some random number. Uh, there, there is a meaning to this. That's the degree of the canonical divisor of the curve, also known as the first churn number of the curve. Okay. The first churn number of the curve. Uh, and uh, this is important for us because uh, when we go to higher dimensions, we don't have a notion of uh, genus in the way we would love to have as for curves. Okay. So the genus somehow gives you a modular space for curves. Uh, for, for varieties is not that simple. So uh, it's good to think about this number in more than one way so that we can recognize what's the correct generalization later, okay? Good. So what is hypervolicity? This thing I just mentioned. Well, uh, there are many notions of hypervolicity, but when you look at the compact case, um, most of them are actually the same. So I prefer to work with broad hypervolicity, which is somehow easier to explain. So smooth projective complex variety, uh, is going to be uh, broadly hyperbolic if every time you have a holomorphic map from the complex line into the variety, it happens to be constant, okay? That's broadly hyperbolicity. So here are a couple of examples. If you have a curve, hypervolicity exactly means that the genus is at least two by Picard's theorem. There is a theorem of Picard saying that, okay, fine, you, you have maps from uh, complex numbers to the Riemann sphere and you have maps from complex numbers to tori, the bias stress functions, right? But that's it. If you want to go to higher genus, you don't have holomorphic maps defined over the whole complex numbers, other than the constant maps, of course, okay? That's a theorem of Picard. 
And more generally, uh, you can generalize this thing to sub varieties of abelian varieties. And if you have a, a sub variety inside a, some abelian variety, and this sub variety does not contain other positive dimensional uh, abelian varieties, up to translation, of course, okay, uh, then it is hyperbolic. Or said in a different way, when you have holomorphic maps, that somehow implies that you have necessarily some uh, abelian variety sitting inside of M. And if you think this is a generalization because you can put your curve inside its Jacobian. So it's a special case of the second item. And this was um, a conjecture of Bloch and then it was proved by Green in this special case and then Kawamata in a more general setting. Okay, and uh, well then, um, what if we, we go back to arithmetic? Why, why are we discussing this thing about the complex numbers? Well, if your variety happens to be defined over a number field like Q, then uh, you can invoke some general conjectures. So there are these conjectures in Biri in dimension two and Voita, which gives you more information, but uh, everything is, you know, spinning around. Uh, these principles uh, that lead the conjectures of Lang on, uh, what to expect about rational points in varieties, okay? Uh, that geometry sh should somehow govern the arithmetic of uh, algebraic varieties. And uh, here the conjecture is that if, you, if your variety is hyperbolic, then uh, the set of rational points has to be finite, okay? Or as Lang says in his uh, books, he says uh, hyperbolic implies mordelic. That's, that's the conjecture, okay? Uh, so this hyperbolicity is kind of important for us because uh, conjecturally it implies finiteness and uh, finiteness means that the question about counting how many rational points you have makes sense. First of all, okay, it makes sense because you may have, for instance, in other situations, a properly contained sub variety having infinitely many rational points, but then you cannot count the points, okay. You, you, you should count, for instance, the, the irreducible components of the, of the Sadisky closure or something like that, something fancier, okay. Now, in the case of sub-varieties of abelian varieties, uh, this conjecture and more are already proved by Falkings in a different paper, okay? And this, uh, th this work of Falkings builds on earlier work by Voita when Voita gave a, a different proof of Mordor's conjecture. So this is purely about uh, Diophantine approximation, okay? All right, so why is the chaboti coleman uh, bound uh, the chaboti coleman bound relevant uh, well there are many reasons uh, but let me just mention a couple of them uh, many people will be left out because i just want to fit this in one slide but uh, i apologize in advance but just to go quickly about uh, some applications of, of these ideas and results well uh, first of all it's used to explicitly compute all the rational points in certain curves there is of course some condition but when the condition is satisfied then it works very well and you can compute the points either because the bound is sharp and you find all the bounds uh, sorry and you find all the points that are allowed by the bound or maybe the bound is not sharp but you can rework ex explicitly these periodic integrals in coleman's proof okay or you can combine the information of different primes in the more than sieve and uh, well there are many ways to apply these ideas okay and that's pretty useful uh, also, there is some progress on the caporazzo harris mason uniformity conjecture, so this conjectural uniform version of Falkin's theorem where the number of points is finite and it can be bounded only in terms of the genus of the curve if you work over Q. So there is uh, some progress by Stoll and Katz and Rabino and Secretary Brown. Uh, there are also non-abelian extensions, uh, first pioneered by Myung Kim, so he worked in the, in the, not in the projective case, but rather the, the line uh, deleting three points, okay? And uh, then this, this approach was extended and generalized to many other settings. And in the context of the Chaboti method, uh, it gives some non-abelian version where the Jacobian is replaced by some fundamental group. And now there's the quadratic case, which is the first case after the linear case, which will be the Jacobian. That's somehow practical in many cases, okay? and uh, was worked out uh, first by Balakrishnan, Besser, Muller, Balakrishnan, and Dogra, okay? In the, in the case of integral points and rational points. And there are some spectacular recent applications of these non-abelian generalizations. It's not, it's not generalizing for the sake of generalizing. I mean, it can actually solve cases where uh, you cannot apply the, the usual Chaboti method, okay? 
and uh, especially the, the curse curve. And of course, uh, Jennifer already gave a talk in this seminar on this uh, wonderful uh, example where uh, all this machinery works like clockwork. Okay, so excellent. Now, uh, how about going to higher dimension? Okay, can we go to higher dimension? Uh, so, well, let's try to understand what's going on here first, okay. First, if you rework the, uh, the, the proof of Chabotin in a heuristic way, don't, don't attempt to prove the full theorem, just in a heuristic way, you quickly realize that the correct uh, Chabotin rank condition here will be that the rank of the abelian variety, the ambient abelian variety, this rank added to the dimension of the sub-variety should be at most the dimension of the ambient abelian variety. Okay, that's, that, that should be the, the Chabotin rank condition. But this, of course, is not enough because your higher dimensional sub-variety may have, I don't know, some elliptic curve of positive rank sitting inside. Okay, so this rank condition alone should not be at the, at the end of the story, but at least it's something that you expect to, to be part of the Chabotin method if it ever works in higher dimension. So, so far, this higher dimensional Chabotin that people are trying to, to prove, right, um, has been explored in the case when the ambient abelian variety is the Jacobian of a curve, and the sub-variety is obtained by adding the curve to itself a couple of times, okay? Or in a different way, you can think about this as taking the, some symmetric power of the curve and taking the addition map into the Jacobian. So that will give you another presentation of this sub-variety. So in this special case, there is some work, uh, I mean, not a bound yet. So there is no analog yet of the, of the Chabotin coleman bound for this setting, but nonetheless, uh, finiteness can be proved and explicitly compute uh, rational points in, in many cases, okay? So why people care about this problem, okay? It looks like a very special curve. Uh, you have a curve and you have the curve to itself. It looks a very special setting, but it's really important. And the reason it is important is because finding points in this uh, X corresponds to the problem of finding algebraic points. So rational points on X correspond to algebraic points on the curve C of degree D at most D. Okay. So uh, there's, there are problems where you really need to compute quadratic points on a curve well, then you should look at the symmetric square. So that's why people care about this problem. So Clansen in 93 gave a first attempt and proved finiteness uh, on a piadic open set of the symmetric power of the curve, but not the whole thing. And then Sixek uh, looked at Clansen's approach and uh, refined it in many ways and made it actually practical in, in some examples. So uh, Sixek actually, Lay, lay the, 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 back, the, the base of a theory about how to compute points on symmetric powers of curves. But still, uh, you don't get a bound. So you don't get a, a nice close uh, bound like in the Coleman theorem, but it's practical. You, you can actually run this uh, algorithmically in many cases, not always, but in many cases. And then uh, Jennifer Park in, in her PhD thesis uh, combined uh, these ideas with, uh, with tropical geometry to get some bound, okay? Not, not a Coleman type of one, but some bound. But unfortunately, apparently the, the, there is uh, some additional hypothesis you need to put into the theorem, like uh, the existence of auxiliary differentials that uh, when you look at, the, at them uh, in a tropical way, to so say they, they are non-degenerate in terms of zeros, okay? And then this was uh, worked out in, in other cases and extended by, by other authors. Up, um, okay, uh, good. So there is some additional hypothesis, but at least is, this is a step forward in the direction of proving a bound, like in Coleman's theorem, in, in at, at least one example in higher dimension, okay? I mean, well, you can take a curve times itself, but of course we're not thinking about that sort of examples, okay? We were thinking about some more interesting examples like this one. All right. So, well, how, how about going beyond curves? And that's the- Can I ask you a question? Uh, yes. I, 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 is do you, Clanson, is that is that should I, is that Matthew Clanson? Oh, probably I I mistyped the Matthew. name. Uh, okay, I I just not sure. I I, 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 should, I, should, go, I should go. I should go out. Another, of the there's another screen. person. Uh, probably yeah. I should uh, go out of the full screen mode and open the thesis because I have it here. 
Oh, don't worry. Okay. I, I okay. think they did. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe at the end. Maybe at the end. Probably okay. not. <laughs> Probably not. Okay. So at the, at the end of the talk, we can, we can, uh, I can give you the process. But in any case, this is in uh, Samir's paper. So Samir gives uh, full credit to, to Glanson to, uh, you know, to be the first person to actually look into this problem. And then he, he, he develops the, the theory in a more explicit way. So this is explained uh, in full detail in, in uh, Samir's paper's uh, introduction. Okay. okay, good. So, all right. So the theorem is this. Uh, you take an abelian variety of dimension three. Oh, I'm going to state this over Q because the statement over number fields is a bit more tricky. You need to keep track of the ramification of a certain prime. I don't want to stay that. It's going to be ugly. Okay, so let me just stay over Q. All right, so you have your abelian variety of dimension three and you take a smooth projective uh, surface inside this abelian threefold defined over Q. You take a prime P. Now the conditions are hyperbolicity. I want the surface to be hyperbolic in the sense we discussed before, broadly hyperbolic if you want. The prime has to be good. Now good, it's a bit more tricky, okay? So A and X have to have good reduction at P. I'm not saying that A is in the Albanese variety of X or something like that. So I'm, I'm asking for A and X to have good reduction at the prime P. And there is one additional reduction condition, which is I want this surface to be hyperbolic mod P. But of course that makes no sense because you don't have uh, complex maps into something mod P. Okay, but still there is a shadow of, the con of this condition which is uh, asking for this surface not to contain elliptic curves. Okay, so that, that's actually what I need. Okay, that the, the, the surface mod P does not contain elliptic curves. Hyperbolic reduction, if you want to call it like this. I need P to be not too small. Uh, not too small is not astronomical, it's just uh, well, what is this thing? Uh, C one square of X is not the square of a number, it's the square of the first churn class. So this is the first churn number of your surface, okay? For hyperbolic surfaces, churn, the first churn number is positive. So this is some positive integer, and this positive integer, which is attached to the canonical class of the, of the surface, you take it square, okay? And then, well, there is a 15 in front, which is purely technical. I, I mean, it doesn't really have a, a deeper meaning, this 15. So the, print, the prime has to be at least 15 times the, 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 chur, the first churn number squared. And the Chaboti rank condition, well, I have a threefold and a surface. So the rank should be at most one, but rank zero is, uh, you know, it's just torsion. So I expect one can deal with the torsion in a different way. So we just focus on the rank one case, which seems to be the most interesting because you do have infinitely many points in this case. Right, so in this setting, then uh, the number of rational points in your hyperbolic surface is at most the number of FP points, which makes sense in this, uh, you, have, you have good reduction, you have a, a way to think about X and more P, plus a factor which is uh, of size P, okay? There is some lower order contribution, but it's of size P, times the first churn number of the surface. Okay, so what is this churn number? Now explicitly, you take the surface, take the canonical divisor, the canonical class, and you self-intersect it, and you get some integer. Okay, that's it. Now, this, of course, uh, is a reasonable uh, substitute for the genus. When you have a gen the genus in a curve, is the first churn number of the curve. In this case, you have the first churn number of the surface. It's also a number attached to the canonical class. Hector, excuse me, yes. please. Uh, one question, please, from Carlo yes. Gaspari. Carlo, would you please ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I can, yes. Yeah, the question was, if condition one implies condition two for P big enough? I don't think so. I thought so before. I don't have a counterexample, but uh, Natalia Garcia, she gave me an example of a surface, which is not contained in some abelian variety. It's just a surface. It is hyperbolic, but when you reduce mod p, there are infinite many primes where you do get rational curves. Okay, so it's not yeah. really asking, answering your question, but uh, suggests that it, it should not be that crazy if you give me an example of uh, an x which is hyperbolic, but is not hyperbolic mod p for infinite many primes. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I don't have an example. Okay, I, I cannot. Example you are you mentioning are uh, this uh, um, Ilbert modular surface or something like this, no? Well, the examples I'm mentioning, no, no, no. She, she constructed something, uh, something uh, different. But uh, probably with Hilbert modular surfaces, you can do something like that. But then you you have to think about the singularizations, and then okay. you do have some exceptional divisors, I think. Okay, thank right? you. Yeah. Yeah. May I ask, is, is condition two something that can be checked if you have an explicit equations for X and A and you have explicit prime P? Uh, the, the fact that you don't have uh, elliptic curves? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not sure. I mean, even checking hyperbolicity is not that trivial, but there is a case where it is easy. And I'm going to state this case where it is easy as a corollary in, uh, in, uh, in this slide. Okay. Okay. So the case where actually you can check this, I mean, this Chabotty business is a theory about having theorems and then finding a situation where actually the, the theorem can be computed, okay? It's not, uh, it's not algorithmic. You, you need a little bit of luck, even for the Chabotty for curves. And uh, in this case, uh, if you give me an abelian threefold over Q uh, with rank one, and assuming that the, the endomorphism ring is Z, Okay, of course, on the modelized space, this is a uh, generic condition. So if you give me a random uh, abelian threefold of, uh, uh, over C, then this is satisfied for free, okay? Then uh, you look at the set of primes where the abelian variety is good and absolutely simple, okay? And, and apparently you can read this from, uh, from the set of function. I haven't checked this if, if this can be done algorithmically, but at least we know that uh, this set of primes has uh, density one in the primes, okay? And there are examples. I mean, uh, people have computed examples. I cannot tell you for sure. These computations are algorithmic. Uh, Hector, maybe you need a little bit of luck. Hector, Hector. we have another question from Peter Sarnak. Yes. yes. Go ahead. Uh, electric babysitting, so I can't. <laughs> Let me try to read my question. Um, the faulting theorem will give you uh, a bound for the number of points effective. Yes. To, uh, do you know what it gives in this setting and how, how your result compares with what he would give? Yeah, yeah. so, so the, the theorem of faultings uh, by the Alphantine approximation gives you a bound for the number of points. Uh, but this bound was explicitly worked out by the, by the first time in higher dimension by, by Ramon. Okay? So there is actually a lot of work to be done there and Ramon did it. So Ramon proved a bound, and the bound uh, I think is uh, has not been improved since yet. But uh, but uh, the, the shape of the bound is you you have an exponential. On the base of the exponential, there are two factors. One factor is the degree of the surface. X. I'm going to state this in the setting. Okay, will be the degree of the surface uh, x with respect to a polarization, uh, you need to fix the polarization of the Abelian variety. So the, the, that's a geometric term, okay? So geometric terms are fine, okay? But then there is the Falkins height of the Abelian variety, which is on the, on the base of the exponential. And then on the exponent, you have, uh, an, uh, you have the, a contribution of the dimensions and the rank, okay? So the, the bound that you, you get from Falkins theorem depends on the Falkins height, okay? okay? And that contribution is uh, somehow uh, less uniform uh, in, a set of, in, in a sense, okay? Okay, that was my question, thanks. Okay, yeah, yeah. And of course, there are a couple of constants in the bound that make that uh, unpractical. Even, even in the case of curves, you have this remote bound for curves, okay? You have it, but it's, for computations, it's not practical. You really want to use the chabotty coleman approach. Good. So going back to what I was saying here is that uh, the, in, the, in the case when you have an absolutely simple abelian variety, then automatically every sub-variety is going to be hyperbolic. And uh, when you have absolutely simple reduction, then uh, again, uh, you, you have this condition on the, on the elliptic curves, okay, for free. So this is a setting where, where the conditions are immediately satisfied. And of course, you need a little bit of luck to, to, to be in this case. But uh, in, in any way, I mean, uh, even for the Chabotty for curves, you need a little bit of luck if you want to apply it for some particular curve, okay? But the good thing is that you have plenty of examples here where this theorem uh, satisfied uh, because this endomorphism condition is generic on the modular space. 
And this rank condition, we don't have a theorem, but uh, we expect it to, to be satisfied a positive proportion of the time. So heuristically, if you start trying uh, abelian varieties of dimension three, the theorem should apply uh, a positive proportion of the time. And uh, well, here's an example, just to tell you that you can find examples that are easy to write down. So you take this, uh, this curve, this genus three curve, the Jacobian is, uh, is suitable for this application. Okay. All right. Good. So uh, about the shape of the bound, uh, Coleman's uh, bound is uh, the number of points in the curve is at most counting points mod p, and then there is the geometric contribution. And counting points mod p, if you fix the curve and vary p, or if you take uh, things randomly in some reasonable way, you expect this to be of size p by the Rima hypothesis, okay? And then the other one is the uh, first chair number. Now, our bound uh, for surfaces in abelian threefolds gives you the number of points mod p. This is a surface, so you expect this to be of size p squared. Okay, and then you have this error term contribution, and the error term contribution is uh, of size p times the first churn number. So that's why I, I allow myself to call this thing an error term, but it's not an asymptotic, of course, it's just an error term for the upper bound. The main part of the upper bound, I expect it to be on the, on the point counting aspect, okay. So in both cases, uh, you, you have this main term coming from counting points and then uh, geometric contribution coming from the canonical class. So after having two data points, you want to interpolate, you know, to, to extrapolate, sorry, to, to, to make a conjecture. So I don't know, I mean, it's very tempting that probably there is a general pattern here. Uh, if ever someone manages to prove a very general Chabot theorem in higher dimensions, maybe it's gonna look like this, I don't know. Okay, so what's the key issue in the proof? Well, um, let me try to explain this. You take the closure of the, of the rational points. This gives you an analytic uh, periodic uh, subgroup of what we call a one parameter subgroup. Okay, over the complex numbers, that's what you will do. And then uh, the, the number of rational points uh, that you want to bound, uh, you, can, you can focus not in the rational points, but rather the surface over the periodics intersect with this uh, one parameter subgroup, okay? And it's a one parameter subgroup because I'm assuming rank one. Now the reduction map allows you to cover your abelian variety periodically with uh, this periodic open sets called a residue disk, which is just the pre-image of a point mod P. And on each residue disk, I'd like to bound this intersection. And hopefully it's going to be one most of the time because if it's one most of the time, then when I vary over the, the mod p points of the surface, I will get the bound that uh, I was discussing before. Okay, you, you, most of the time you add one and then there is some error term contribution. Okay, that will give you a bound of this form. So that will be the plan, but of course this is not a plan. This is kind of a wish list. Uh, you actually need to do something to prove something like this. Okay, so here's the picture. Uh, here is a residue disk coming from just one point mod p. There is uh, the portion of the surface that lands into the residue disk. And there is this line, which is this one parameter subgroup. I think about this additively because in reality, uh, when, you, when you look at these periodic lead groups close to the identity, you can linearize everything, okay? Good. So how to bound this intersection in one residue disk? Well, you parameterize your periodic uh, one parameter subgroup gamma, you parameterize this uh, with some uh, power series. Uh, you, you need to choose local coordinates, usual business, but there is some power series uh, parameterization. And uh, then you compose with a local equation for the surface. So gamma will hit the surface precisely when this composition vanishes. So now the question is about counting uh, zeros of this one variable power series having a power series for the, for the one parameter group and then composing with the, with the equation for, for the surface, okay? And there is some radius, of course, uh, you need to set, set up things properly if at the end you want to end up with a number, okay? You need to normalize things and well. All right, so how you count zeros? So you, if, if you start with uh, some uh, one variable power series over the periodics that's convergent on some disk, uh, 
let, let me define n sub zero hr as the number of series counting multiplicity up to radius r, okay? And well, a standard chaotic fact, one can bound this, okay? And to bound this, you can do it in many ways, but something that's convenient would be to have control uh, growth for the coefficients, that the, conf the coefficients do not grow too fast. That's one thing. And there is some small degree for which you have a large coefficient. A large, I don't know, bigger than or equal to one will do it, okay? If you have these two, then you can use standard periodic uh, analysis to, to get a bound, uh, a reasonable bound for the number of zeros. Now, in our case, uh, this parametrization of the, of, of the one parameter periodic uh, subgroup, this parametrization is coming from the exponential map, and we have really good bounds for, for the coefficients. So item one can be done, okay? It's not too bad. You, 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 you just can do it uh, using, uh, you know, suitable choice of local parameters, exponential map, lots of time, the triangle inequality, and then there you go, okay? The problem is two. How, how you ensure that you have a small coefficient, sorry, uh, you have a small degree for which the coefficient is not too small, okay? And of course, that looks very much like non-vanishing mod p controlling the vanishing order of something mod p. You reduce the power series mod p, and you want that the zero of this reduction mod p is not to be the, the, the order of the zero. Looks like that, okay? So the key challenge would be to look at this power series and ensure a large coefficient periodically in low degree. And large means non-zero mod p. That will do it. I don't need larger than that. So the idea is what I just said. You reduce gamma mod p, and bound the contact order with the reduction of x mod p, because you are looking at this composition and f is an equation for uh, f is an equation for x. Looks wonderful, looks very nice, except that it makes no sense. Why? Because this power series has denominators. Okay, it's coming from an exponential, so there is some division by factorial. There are denominators, so you can you cannot really reduce this mod p. But at least the idea the idea looks fine, but uh, it doesn't work. Okay. So uh, in the remaining part of the talk, let me just quickly try to explain uh, how to save this idea. And uh, the, the approach is what we call the overdetermined uh, method for infinitesimal, infinitesimal omega integrality. So an algebraic version of solving an, a differential equation would be this omega integrality, which is uh, if you have two schemes, uh, S and V, and you have a map from V to S, and a differential form on S, then we say that this map is omega integral, meaning uh, heuristically a solution of, uh, of the differential equation determined by omega. It's omega integral if the pullback of omega is zero. Now, it's not really the pullback because the pullback lives in the pullback shift, but you don't want to land in the pullback shift. You want to land in the differentials of V. So there is some additional work to be done, but you define this pullback properly, and, and that's a condition that the pullback of omega is zero. All right, so we are gonna use this on non-reduced schemes in positive characteristic. So the intuition over the complex numbers will not really help uh, too much. Actually, it's, it's not really help uh, plays against you, okay? So the intuition over, over the complex numbers plays against you in this business. All right, so this omega integrality is implicit in classical works by Nakai. Uh, he didn't really write this down in this way, but it's, it is there. And uh, it's really useful in hyperbolicity. So Bogomolov used this to, to prove a finiteness theorem for curves of genus zero and one on certain general type surfaces. McQuillan generalized to, to the holomorphic setting and made some improvements. And Voita uh, made an explicit version of, of this business to find uh, curves of genus zero and one uh, in, the, in the Bicky surface, okay, which is related to some problem in logic that I very much like, but I'm not explaining today. Uh, so, Right, and then uh, Garcia Fritz. Uh, so, well, Natalia, she, she worked out a very detailed, detailed, very detailed generalization of Voita's approach that works not just in one case, but in more cases, and you can take advantage of ramification of higher order. But uh, what is more important for us is that her generalization is purely algebraic. You don't really need any analytic considerations. It's everything algebraic. So it was good for us because we could just take inspiration from this and one or two lemmas from here and there to actually make them work in positive characteristic for non-reduced schemes. All right, so the remark here is that going from Bogomolov to Voita is not that obvious because uh, 
uh, I mean, having finiteness is not the same as finding the objects, right? It's like points and curves. You, you have finiteness for the points and uh, rational points and curves, but that's a different story of if you want to, uh, to actually find the points, okay? So that's more or less the step from Bogomolov to Voita here. Okay, so here, here's the idea. You take uh, omega one and omega two independent uh, differentials, having nice reduction mod p, okay? One can do that, uh, and then, uh, the condition is that this one parameter subgroup is omega integral. So one has to prove that uh, when you have a one parameter subgroup, first you can make sense of omega integrality because this is a, somehow, uh, it's analytic, but you can think about this as a former scheme. And there is a notion of omega integrality there and, um, and the kernel in this space has a mention too, in our case. So there are independent differentials. And then you express this gamma as a power series and try to reduce uh, not mod p, but mod a power of z, okay, a suitable power of z, and only up to degree not too big, not larger than p, so that you don't run into denominators. And then, uh, well, the truncation of this gamma is going to give you um, an infinitesimal curve, okay, infinitesimal, so this is actually supported on a point. It just has higher order jets, but it's supported at a point. And this is going to be a closed immersion, which has to be checked, but it's true, okay? And it's going to be omega integral for two differentials, two independent differentials. And it reduces nicely mod p because the differentials do and the degree is not too big. Okay, and then you reduce and you get a map with, of similar quality uh, mod p, but now this map exists, although uh, the one parameter subgroup does not. Okay, the one parameter subgroup mod p uh, is no longer there, but the, the map it is. And uh, all right, so we have this infinitesimal version of the one parameter subgroup mod p. And f is a local equation for x in this uh, residue disk. And the key observation is that if you look at the composition, f composed with gamma, the coefficients are periodically small. If that happens, you reduce, uh, you reduce mod p, not f composed with gamma, but rather f composed with this infinitesimal truncation of gamma that can be reduced mod p. If you get zero, it means that the, the phi m, which is the reduction mod p of this infinitesimal one parameter subgroup, is actually a closed immersion, not just on the abelian variety, but actually on the surface, okay? That's the key observation. Small coefficients give you a closed immersion into the surface mod p. And now what happens is that you can take the differentials and reduce mod p restrict to the surface. And you need to prove they are non-zero, but that's a different story. And now you have a surface, two differentials and one common solution. And that's overdetermined. That should not exist. Okay, so you, uh, you expect to bound the order to which you can find this infinitesimal solution. You cannot go forever because uh, it's just overdetermined in the sense of differential equations. Okay, so you want to find what is the largest M for which this situation can actually happen, and that will give you a bound for what is the largest M for which the coefficients are small. Okay, so here's the statement, here's a, a lemma, okay, a lemma to, to actually make precise how to bound the order of an infinitesimal solution of an overdetermined uh, ODE in this setting on a surface. I don't want to read this because uh, I, I think this is not very elegant, but the important part of the bound is that the order is bounded by a quantity that at the end depends on the geometry of this divisor, omega one, w one, wedge w two, which is a canonical divisor. So this divisor can be used to bound the order of the overdetermined solution. So there is this technicality that some of these semants can be infinity, infinity, okay? That's really, really playing against us. So we need to get rid of this possibility and here's where the hypothesis of not containing elliptic curves shows up. Here's an example, uh, which because of time probably I will not uh, work out here the details, but let, let me show you the picture, okay? So here you have an omega one, ds plus t squared dt, and the integral curves are these cubics, okay? These are cubics. So here you have an infinitesimal vertical solution up to order uh, 
three, I think. No, two, two. You need to kill the, the cube and then you have order two, yes. If you look at this mod Z cube, then you have a vertical solution. And here you have another differential, ds plus s squared dt, and you have some hyperbolas that move vertically, and then this limit curve, which is, you can check that uh, s equal to zero is a solution. Now you take the divisor of omega one, which omega two, you can just compute what this is, and the divisor is the diagonal and, and the anti-diagonal. And you look the diagonal, the anti-diagonal, they look nothing like this omega integral curves, but nonetheless, uh, one can compute the contribution here of both, and you get, using this ugly formula from before, zero plus one plus zero plus one, two, which agrees with the fact that you have a common solution up to order two. So this ugly bound is actually sharp. Okay. It's actually sharp, some examples. Okay, so in the remaining, I don't know, five minutes, let me just give you a slightly more detailed sketch of proof, how, how you bound, um, how to prove a column and bound in, in this uh, hyperbolic surfaces in abelian threefolds. So here's the main result. You have an abelian threefold, uh, a hyperbolic surface sitting inside, the rank is one, and some condition on P that is not going to show up in this argument because I'm skipping all the technicalities, okay? Then uh, the, you have uh, that the number of rational points is less than the number of FP points plus this error term. That is, has, it has some geometric origin. We should see the canonical divisor contributing to the error term. All right, so the setting is that you, you take the closure of the points, rank one implies that you have a one parameter subgroup. The reduction map gives you these uh, neighborhoods to, to cover the, the, the abelian variety periodically. And on each of these residue disks, you want to bound the intersection of the periodic points of the surface and the one parameter subgroup coming from the rational points. And this bound, if it is less than or equal to one most of the time, you're good because then you can add it and get a bound of this form. All right, uh, because when you add over, uh, over the FP points, you are basically adding one most of the time. All right, so you parameterize your, your periodic one parameter subgroup, you compose with the local equation, you get some one variable periodic power series on a disk, and this disk is coming from the residue disk, and uh, you want to control the number of zeros because that's an upper bound for this intersection. All right, and to control the number of zeros, of course, uh, if you believe me, uh, we need two things. One is an upper bound for the growth of the, of the coefficients, and another is an index not too big for which I can find a coefficient which is uh, actually large. Okay. Right, so you take omega one and omega two, two differentials on the beginning variety that kill the one parameter subgroup. And then, the, as I mentioned before, the classical theory tells you that uh, you, you need these two things, controlling the size of the coefficients from above and one coefficient from below. And when you put these, these things together and do some periodic analysis, this is the bound that you get. P minus one over P minus two times M of X plus one, and M of X is coming from this overdetermined method, okay? So it's going to be the largest M uh, with an overdetermined uh, closed immersion, mod P, supported at the point X, and the point X is the point giving you the, the residue disk. So our theory of overdetermined in omega integrality in characteristic P will give you a bound for this MX depending on the, on the canonical divisor of uh, W1 wedge W2. Now this change Omega to W is not just a uh, font, okay? Omega is a differential in characteristic zero on the abelian variety. You reduce mod P and then you restrict to the surface mod P, that's W. And of course, you need to prove that this wedge is non-zero and that's really tricky, okay? It's some sort of uh, weak Lepchus property in characteristic P that you need to prove. All right, so when, you, when your point mod P is not in the support of the divisor, this ugly bound that I mentioned before is actually an empty sum, okay? And it's not just a formality. This situation has to be proved as a separate case in the proof of the ugly bound, okay? So uh, in this case, uh, you, the, the bound is zero. 
the, the maximal order of an overdetermined solution is going to be just zero. And in this case, therefore, you get that the number of points is at most in the intersection of the one parameter subgroup with the surface within the residue disk corresponding to the point x mod t. That intersection is at most p minus one over p minus two. Now, our prime is larger than 15 eventually, okay? So certainly this fraction is less than two, but you have an integer less than two. And since the integer is less than two, it is at most one. Okay, this silly thing is actually important when you add up all these contributions. If you don't do it at this point, then you get an additional factor at the end of the bound. Now, the, what happens when your point mod P is in the, in the canonical divisor D? Well, in this case, the overdetermined bound also works, but it's way more complicated to apply. Okay, there, there is a lot of things going on there. You need to apply the Riemann hypothesis in the, for, for curves, but in the singular case, and Furthermore, you need to put some multiplicities to certain points. Uh, you need to do some intersection theory computations. You need to control the singularities of this D because actually D is not a nice curve. I cannot assume anything about D. D is just whatever the differentials give you and I have no control on the differentials, okay? Uh, you need this weak Lefschetz property, a, blank, a bunch of injectivities at the level of cohomology, positive characteristic. It is what it is, okay? But the important part, I'm not going into these details, but the important part is that at the end of the day, all of this mess depends on the divisor D, which is a canonical divisor. So I hope that you, you see in this way, how is that this uh, self-intersection of the canonical divisor shows up in the error term. That's the reason. So here, here's the final bound. You add up uh, all the contributions. Away from the canonical divisor mod P, you get one. Okay, and when you add one many times, you just count, okay? And that gives you the main term, the number of points mod P. And then add the canonical divisor, you, you get some larger bound, but you need to do all the work that I hinted before, and you get this error term. So here's a picture. This is the surface mod P. The blue lines are the divisor D, the canonical divisor D. If the point giving you the, the residue disk, if this point is not on D, then the intersection may look like this, a piece of the surface, periodically intersected just with the, with the one parameter subgroup once, or maybe zero times, okay? And this is in the one residue disk. And now, if your residue disk comes from a FP point on the divisor D, then you may have more points in the intersection, okay? You may have, for instance, this one parameter subgroup meeting the surface at two different points, or maybe seven different points within the residue disk. But that, that's basically what's going on. And this is a lower dimensional contribution. So at least heuristically, I hope you, you believe me that it, it contributes to the error term, but to actually prove this explicit bound requires some work using this ugly bound for overdetermined uh, solutions. Okay, and that's all. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>